Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, this is, we, we don't ever know who's going to be here on a weekend like this, but how many of you work tomorrow? Anybody? Yeah, see, so here we are, normal weekend, right? Um, for those online, hello. Um, I want to say hello to my family who are all at the Lake Cottage in Michigan. Hello, family. Um, <clears throat> you can see me, but I can't see you. Um, so um, anyway, um, we're kicking off a series today called Christ in Us. So as we start this month-long series focused on the theme of Christ in Us, this timely series of messages will challenge each of us to more fully grasp the thought that God will never, ever leave us or forsake us. And as followers of Jesus, we are so intertwined with him that God's presence impacts our lives daily and every breath we take. But living our lives, I don't know about you, but it's a full-time job. Uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Our jobs, families, commitments, eating, sleeping, health and wellness, fun, and all those things consume our days. And, you know, if it seems like if I ask 10 people, uh, how are you doing? I would say most would say, I'm busy. And that's probably a common phrase that we use a lot. But I'm busy. So on top of all this, we face many uncertainties nearly in every one of these excuse me, areas. Our jobs change. Um, things happen around us. Family situations change. Um, our kids are growing up. Financial uncertainties, medical challenges, and even more come to top of mind as we go through life. And nothing, nothing ever seems to stay the same. And so this is why this series of messages is important. Because Christ in us, he provides hope, vision, assurances, and stability. Let's just take a moment and pray. Father God, we come before you. Um, we thank you for the time that we had to worship this morning. We thank you that um, you are here in the midst of us. And we are appreciative of that. And so, Lord, today, um, as we sing this morning, speak your words of life. Lord, would you speak your words of life that we may learn and understand today? I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for this church. And I thank you that, Lord, your word is true here. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to go a little different route today. But today we're going to look at the 12 disciples who faced dramatic changes in their lives. So imagine the whirlwind they encountered in a period of just around three years. First of all, they were pulled away from their livelihoods and their way of life. <clears throat> just think of that. Hey, you're a fisherman. Now you're following me, right? Um, just things that happened that were unbelievable. Uh, they left their families and friends, and uh, that was without any internet or cell phones or FaceTime to communicate to them, right? No Zoom meetings with your family. They followed an unknown teacher. You know, there wasn't much known at that time. They, they weren't sure who Jesus was, but he called them and they responded. And they witnessed events that they've never seen before or could never have imagined. Take, for example, healings. I mean, not just healings, but I'm talking about healings, big time, right? The blind see, the lame walk. He cast out demons. He multiplied the fish and the, and the loaves, the bread. That would be pretty cool to see that. I, I, if you can go back in heaven and you can look at the replays, that's one I want to see, you know. Um, on the Chosen, the series Chosen, they, they show that. But it, I, I think it can be better than that. So I can't imagine how God really did that. Um, the dead were raised. Uh, we don't normally see that around here. Um, and these are just to name a few. But if you could imagine... They started following him, and they started seeing these things. What was happening? And then all of this was in such a short period of time, and it was probably information and experience overload. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I think we probably all have in some way. And for us, too, there's a place of unknown that we enter in when we begin to follow Jesus. We experience that because when we start following Jesus, Things are going to change. Now the time has come for Jesus to begin preparing his disciples for something that is going to rock their world. He's telling them that he will be leaving them soon. You know, think about this. Hey, 
come and follow me. And just a short time later, it says, I'm leaving. And could you imagine the, the whirlwind that they were in? And to say the least, the disciples were confused. They were filled with anxiety and uncertainty. They were troubled, and I would even suggest they were even afraid. So much was happening that it was hard for them even to begin to comprehend what was happening. So what was all this going to mean to them? Where was Jesus going? Was he using one of his uh, usual metaphors, that is, just a figure of speech that he was leaving? Or was he using one of his parables, you know, one of those epic stories that he was telling? They could not grasp what he was saying. And if the disciples were anything like we are, or we like anything like the disciples were, our minds and their minds probably began to wonder the what ifs and the maybes. Could you imagine how your mind just starts whirling around, laying in bed at night thinking, what's this happening? How is this going to work out? Wait a minute, he just called us, now he's leaving. I don't know what that means. I saw some amazing things around him, but what's happening? So it's very confusing when you get all of this dumped on you and you're in a situation that you really don't know what is happening or you hear something and your mind starts thinking other things. You've been in that position before? Yeah, I think we all have. This reminds me of a time when my youngest daughter um, was in, it was either early middle school or late elementary school. She was having a, a sleepover with friends. And um, I traveled a lot, and I was, it was early evening, and I remember going up to her, and she was with maybe six of her little friends have within a sleepover, right? And they were in the living room, and I came up to our daughter, Grace, and I said, hey, Grace, come here. And I said, uh, um, Daddy's going to leave um, pretty soon, but I said, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to go to sleep, and I'm not going to see you for two weeks. So I wanted a hug. I didn't think anything of it, and I started turning away after I gave her a hug. And one of her little friends came up to her, and remember, this little friend heard this, but really wasn't comprehending, and said, he can't sleep that long. <laughs> See, what she, what she heard, she just couldn't comprehend, and it just didn't make sense to her. And sometimes I wonder you know, if we're like that. We wonder and wonder and wonder. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, um, turn, in, uh, turn to John 14, and we're going to read a selection of verses there that will bring the light here. So it's kind of long, so just be patient with me, and I believe it's on the screen. John chapter 14, verse 1, and these are the words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I mean, we could stop there and have a finished message. My father's house has many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you, or excuse me, my father's house has many rooms, and if that were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. <clears throat> Skip down to verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, or the word comforter, to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Let me read verse 20 again. That's a key verse. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. All this I have spoken still while with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. 
If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to my Father. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the Father is greater than I, and I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Pretty, pretty profound words from Jesus. And, you know, if we understand this, it might be the first time or near the first time that Jesus is preparing them and telling them, hey, um, things are going to change. I'm leaving. And they don't know what that means. And these verses to them and his response to them seems to be to provide comfort and to provide some level of reassurance to them to maybe take away their confusion or to help that. The key point is centered on the idea that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus would still be with them and he would be in them. The scriptures are clear that Christ has promised us that he dwells in the lives of believers, just as he did the disciples, his followers, you and me. And because of the confusion surrounding the thought of Jesus leaving, Jesus was trying to reassure them and comfort disciples, just kind of in the same way he still does today to us. Jesus went to great lengths to help his disciples understand the situation. He wasn't leaving them, you know, in the, in the dark. He went to great lengths to help them understand. Jesus explained why it was important for him to leave. Um, I don't have these on the, on the screen, but John 16, 7 says, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down and you can look at it later. But verily, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I leave, the advocate or the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send them to you. Now, I wonder if at this point they're thinking, um, it's better that I go. Hmm? Really? You know, it's pretty comfortable having you around here, Jesus. When we're hungry, you just feed us. And, you know, all this stuff happens. If we have to pay taxes, you have us go fishing and we take a coin out of a fish's mouth, right? Things were pretty easy for them, so to say. And then John 14, 20, as we read, on that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Since the day the Holy Spirit was sent, Jesus lives in us. Since the Holy Spirit was sent, Jesus lives in us. So just as the disciples ask questions, I I think it's probably fair that we do too. So this morning, we're going to try to answer And I'll probably give you some insight on three questions or or situations that come about when we ask the question, why does it matter to us that Christ is in us? Why? Why why does it matter? Those are really nice words. It's really flowery and beautiful poetic language. But why is it important? And why does it matter that Christ lives in us? And I want to share three thoughts from what we've read in the scripture. So most of these come right from the book of John. First of all, Christ in us through the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And we see that in John 14, 16, John 14, 25, and John 16, 7. He's our comforter. So in the same way that Jesus was trying to comfort the disciples about the importance of his leaving, these words are still true to us. My question is then, how are we comforted if he's going to be our comfort? And so let me suggest a few ways. First of all, we're comforted because we learn that Jesus is Lord of all. What do I mean by this? Well, so when he was going to ascend to the Father, um, he was not just going to be um, Lord, so to say, over the situations that they're facing. You know, when when we're together, um, we can kind of see each other moving, and, you know, we comfort in knowing you can provide for us. All of a sudden, we see now him positioning himself to not only be Lord of the current and the situation that they're in, but he was positioning himself to be Lord of the cosmos, the great universe, Lord of all. And this move was going to turn out really, really good for them. It turned out really good for us. This, in essence, my friends, what I call faith in action. It's one thing to see it, but not to know it, but he's Lord of all, we have to trust. But that's faith in action. So not only is he Jesus, uh, Jesus Lord of all, he also promised them that he wasn't going to leave them as orphans. Well, that's kind of comforting to know, right? He promised that he would never leave them or forsake them. He does the same for us. I don't know if you've ever been in a position before 
where you felt abandoned, where you felt like no one cares, nothing is going your way, just remember that he has not left us as orphans, just as the same with the disciples. We are cared for, we are provided for, we are loved, and we are not our own. He's taken care of us. And just as our advocate that we talked about, oh, excuse me, yeah, as an advocate, he will defend us and support us from the heavens. So the word advocate or support or comforter says in the dictionary, one who defends or pleads the case on behalf of another. We have a couple lawyers in the room tonight, today, I believe, and they are used to defending or prosecuting on some cases, but they're defending, they're advocating for their clients. And if you have a good lawyer like that, it's kind of comforting to the, the person that they are, are, are defending. But as a comforter, comforter, he pleads our case in the heavens. And in Hebrews 7.25, it says, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to make intercession on their behalf. Something is happening in the heavenlies right now. I don't know what situation you're going through. I know what situations I'm going through. And it is great comfort to know that I have an intercessor, Jesus himself, interceding at the right hand of the Father for me. There's something special about that. And I think it's in our grasp just to take that. And Jesus also comforted his disciples with the promise that he was going to return. He was going to prepare a place for them, and then he was going to return. Hey, you're leaving, but hey, I'm coming back. Now, they don't know what that means, but it kind of is reassuring and comforting that Jesus is that comfort. So the second reason I want to suggest that it matters that Christ is in us is that Jesus in us is an anchor. Jesus in us is an anchor. And you know, an anchor provides stability and security. The term anchor can be used metaphorically to represent something or someone that provides stability, support, and a sense of grounding in various aspects of our life. Okay, pause here for a moment. We all need this. We need Jesus in our lives to be that anchor. We need him as that someone to support us, to give us stability and a sense of grounding in our lives. Hey, remember earlier on I talked about people saying they're busy? Well, we are busy. And it is great to know that as we travel through life, we have someone, himself, Jesus Christ, who is going to provide that stability for us if we trust in him. Along with this as an anchor, one of the things that as an anchor, um, he teaches us all things. We read this in the scriptures that he teaches us these things. And the truth is important because, you know, um, it informs a foundation for us, for knowledge, for trust, for ethical conduct, problem solving, progress, personal growth, and meaningful relationships. Do you know, we need a teacher like this. Um, there's, there's a lot going on in the world, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't know what to believe anymore, okay? Can we shake our heads yes or no, right? I don't know what to believe half the time. There's so much being thrown at us. And what I appreciate is God's word who is presenting to us a truth. And I like that. And truth is an anchor of stability in our lives. And on top of that, thinking about the truth, Jesus himself proclaims, not only is he the way and the life, but he is the truth. Folks, if we're looking for the truth, we don't have to look any further than Jesus himself and his words. He provides us truth. And when we think of truth, you know, we think of the mysteries that we don't know and things that we don't realize. But you realize that Jesus and the Apostle Paul frequently use the term mystery to describe the message of salvation. Well, Jesus often spoke about the mystery of the gospel during his teachings. The term mystery in the co context of the gospel refers to truths or aspects of God's plan that were previously hidden or unknown, but are now revealed through Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's in the big picture, yes. But for you and I, he reveals to us that mystery of who he is and how he loves us in the church. And you realize that Jesus, because of this, is a good teacher to learn from. 
one of my life verses, does anybody else have a life verse that you kind of follow? Yeah. So one of my life verses, probably the number one, is a scripture that's found in Psalm 32, verse 8. And it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you. So what does this mean? He's for us, not against us. He's on our side. And as we walk through life, I can't tell you how many times this scripture has been proclaimed in my prayers. And just in my time alone with him, and Lord, I, I need you to counsel me. I need you to lead me with your loving eye upon me. And I'm not afraid to ask that. I mean, after all, he loves us, right? He wants good things for us. He wants us to walk in his will and his way. So I'm not afraid to ask him to teach me that. And the second thing is not only does he teach us as an anchor, but he also reminds us of what he's taught us. Now, I don't know about you, but I constantly need to be reminded of everything, of many things, right? And it's interesting that um, when you're 20 and 25, nah, you got it all up here, right? Um, and your, your knowledge base is, you know, pretty thin at that point. As you go through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and enter your 60s, let me just, just say, um, we need to be reminded more and more and more, right? Because first of all, why? Why are we reminded? Because, you know, being reminded seems to be counterintuitive because we already knew it one time and now we have to be reminded of it. But first of all, we are humans with a limited memory capacity. We aren't God. We have a limited amount of whatever it is in here that we can grasp things. And we sometimes get information overload. You know, um, one of the things we think about being reminded is, um, I don't know about you, I know about me, that I try to constantly remember those things that God has done for me in the past. We always think about looking to the future, but I sometimes pause and think of what God has already done for me and how those things are building blocks for the next thing that I might face. I'll never forget an example in our family's life. But when our daughter Rachel, and Rachel comes here with Scott, her husband, and Colin and Lucy. Hi, Rachel at the lake. Anyway, um, <laughs> when Rachel was young, I'm talking five, six years old. I remember that she was in kindergarten. And um, so I have maybe five, somewhere in there. Um, and Rachel was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Yeah, that was a long time ago, and it didn't have as good a things to do and care, to, medical care that they do now. But, um, you know, it was scary for mom and dad. She's our firstborn. She's in a hospital for a week. That was really, really scary. And I can remember one time during the week, my wife and I kind of got a break because her mom, my wife's mom, uh, Mary, came and, who Rachel adored, as did all the grandchildren, but Mary, Grandma, stayed with Rachel in the hospital while we got a little break, a little respite. And when we kind of came back and made the switch and such like that, Grandma was, like, astounded about some things that Rachel was telling her. That little old five-year-old started preaching to Grandma about God's faithfulness. And somewhere along the line, she had heard things and put it together in her mind, and she remembered some of the things that God did in the scriptures. Now, this is profound, and I got goosebumps bigger than I probably have had in a long time right now, just to tell you this. But she told grandma that just as the same way that the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown in the fiery furnace, that when they came out, they were not burned, and they didn't smell like smoke. And she said, Grandma, that's how God's going to take care of me. I'm going to come out of this, and I'm not going to smell a smoke, or I'm not going to burn up. Basically, he is going to take great care of me. Isn't that good for a five-year-old? I mean, that's good for a 65-year-old, you know? But, but she was somewhere informed of this through the years. Maybe in a Sunday school class, maybe in a, you know, something that we read. But that was pretty cool. 
So being reminded of these things, you know, when, when we go through something that's kind of hard, I remember this story. Hey, yeah, uh, maybe Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, hey, they did all right. They made it, right? So information overload is something that we face today. Um, it's a concept that is known as knowledge doubling curve. How many have ever heard of that? The knowledge doubling curve, which suggests that human knowledge as a whole doubles at an increasing rapid pace. According to the research of Buckminster Fuller in the 1980s, I'm sure all of you have read that study, human knowledge doubled approximately every century around the year 1900. By the end of the Second World War, knowledge doubled every 25 years. So this is all knowledge, right? More recently, IBM estimated that knowledge was doubling every 12 to 13 months. That was in 2010. And they estimate that it could start doubling every 12 hours by the year 2025. Folks, that's not that far away. We're being bombarded with knowledge and data and everything, right? You know, um, I did some things here. I, I love technology, and I started uh, a while back looking at artificial intelligence and chat GPT. Anybody, anybody heard of that? Um, yeah, okay. So this is kind of crazy stuff, but um, like a month ago, as I was starting to prepare for this, I, I put in chat GPT, prepare a sermon for me. I mean, really, I just typed this in, prepare a sermon about the importance of Christ in us. I said, enter. And it went within 20 seconds. Went, doo, 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 doo. It gave me an opening, three points, a conclusion, and it also wrote a closing prayer for me. How about that? <laughs> now, this isn't it, okay, because I, <laughs> just to be sure, honest and everything, but this stuff is coming at us. You know, really, if I was a preacher, I'd be using it a lot uh, every week. I mean, it's a great research tool, see? And so um, I, I think it's really important to, to understand these things are coming out, coming after us. And because of that, we're easily distracted. Um, digital devices, technology. Wait, be honest. How many are on their phones doing something else different now? Now you don't have to raise your hand. But see, we're already distracted. And I've not only been here like 22 minutes. We're already distracted. But technology does that to us. And the rise of smartphones, social media, and the digital devices has made distractions more accessible and prevalent. Notifications, alerts, nee, 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 nee. you know, we want to look, right? And the constant urge to check messages and social feeds can disrupt our concentration that leads to much disruptions in our life. We used to think ADD was bad. Just put ADD with this and we're in trouble. Lack of mindfulness and self-control contribute to this because we don't have self-control to hold on to what we want to hold on to. And the other thing is, while we're being reminded of things, um, be re being reminded um, as part of that anchor, um, it holds us accountable when needed. I think we all need to, to be held accountable and being reminded is a good thing. One of my favorite sayings, and I'm not going to say that I said this to my wife before, but it, let's just say if the shoe fits, I might need to wear it, okay? And I've just said, hey, look, if I tell you I'll do something, that means I'll do it. You don't have to keep reminding me every six months. <laughs> and she's at the lake cottage. She's high-fiving everybody. And that's true, right? <laughs> the third thing of Christ in us is that Christ is in us to empower us. Jesus' departure from this, uh, set the stage for the Holy Spirit to live in the disciples and to empower them for their message of spreading hope of the gospel and expanding the kingdom of God on earth. Matthew 28, 18, and then Acts 1 and 2 talks about the Great Commission, the sending out. You know, when Jesus was with us, you know, they went certain places and he did send them out for a little bit, but they came back. But all of a sudden, when he left and the Holy Spirit came, they were scattered everywhere. And we are grateful for that here in Muncie, Indiana, because eventually it came to us. See, Christ in us builds our faith. 
the disciples had to learn early on to rely on their faith because Jesus is absent. You know, what are we going to do now? We're going to have to have him lead us. And that's where the Holy Spirit came in. This was the beginning of a time where they had to learn to trust Jesus because he wasn't physically present. And he said, you believe in, you believe, uh, he, what he was telling them, excuse me, is that I believe in you. You've got this. I'm not leaving you and I'm not abandoning you, but because I'm leaving, I'm giving you everything that you need to carry on. You've got this, people. So, a couple conclusions and takeaways. First of all, Christ in us means that we are not alone. We are comforted and we can have peace. Now, we talked about the disciples and such this morning, but now we want to talk about us. Are you feeling alone? Do you encounter situations where you feel that you're all by yourself? Not only um, is that not true, because Jesus himself is one there to be with you through this comforter of the Holy Spirit. We are not alone. And he gives us peace. Some of it is, is that we just have to hold our hands out and receive it. Now, I'm not saying this is the easy. This is not just like a magic formula. This isn't, this isn't just, you know, praying it's done. But sometimes we have to walk through this to get to it. You know, Jesus doesn't always promise us the, the, the smoothest path. But what he does promise is that through all of it, he will be with us and comfort us and be there with us. We're not alone. He will walk with us on our journey. The second conclusion is that we can follow the example of Jesus by showing forgiveness and compassion to others. You know, when he met the disciples where they were on, that, on, on the journey and saying, I'm going to leave, you know, he met them with, with compassion. He knew it was going to be hard for them to leave, right? And so as he was leaving, he, he met them and said, look, I'm on your side here, guys. And, and I don't want to leave you helpless. And so, you know, I'm going to send this Holy Spirit, my Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be in you. I'm not just going to be with you anymore. I'm going to be in you. And so do what I did. And that was show forgiveness and compassion. And then the third takeaway for us is that we are sent out to bring the good news and good to the world. Now, we have a responsibility as a believer to share our lives, share the gospel in some way. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. I don't care what it is and what your leaning is and all your, you know, your different um, uh, strengths, weaknesses, what, if you're a D or an S or um, whatever your personality might be, please understand that God's going to use you, who you are, how you are, the way he made you, and you don't have to be anything different. That's the way it works. Some people share the gospel and don't say a word. They just love people. We know people like that. Some people are very vocal and share their examples. That's fine, too. You know, I say if we put this whole room together, God's got many, many messengers that can share his word in special ways. You see, Jesus, just as Jesus entrusted his disciples with his message of hope, he does the same for us. He dwells in us, not only with us. He gives us our daily doses of what we need to live our lives. We have been entrusted with an amazing gift. Folks, the gift is that the creator of everything, the God of the universe, has chosen not only to be with us, but that same God, the creator of all, has chosen to live in us. That is power. That is powerful, my friends. He has chosen to live with us. Do we have the tools needed to live this life? We sure do. Is it easy? No. But whatever we're facing, just be assured, the creator of the universe, the creator of all cosmos, lives within us. He lives within us so his kingdom will be expanded on this earth. And for most of all, that he would be glorified. Amen. Lisa? Thank you so much, Ted. I'd like to close us in prayer together. Let's re reflect a little bit 
on what we were reminded of this morning. Perhaps there's been something on your mind that's been circulating. Perhaps you've been distracted by uh, something uh, that's heavy on your heart today, a concern that you have. And so, uh, Holy Spirit, I ask that you just bring to mind something for each one of us that we can hold before you today. God, would you bring to mind one thing that's been on our heart or on our mind that we need to trust you with? And God, as we think about that one thing or that person or that circumstance, Holy Spirit, I ask that you remind us now of a truth that you brought to our attention this morning through your word, through something that Ted said. How is the fact that Christ in us meets us in this concern that we have? Is it that we need a comforter? Is it that we need to uh, be guided in your truth? Is it the fact that maybe we feel so alone, we, we just need a word again that, that you are closer than the air that we breathe, noticing every detail of our life and our truest companion? Is it maybe we're in a space that we have no idea how to pray and we're so overwhelmed we need to remember that, Spirit, you intercede for us and you're fighting for us and indeed for us. What is it, Jesus, that you want to remind us of this morning and take away with us as we leave? We praise you that you are our defender and our supporter, that you are our advocate. We thank you that you will empower us and teach us all things. And so in our weakness, we say by faith, we trust you to make us strong. And Lord, we pray that um, your words would sit in our spirit today as we leave. And again, be the light that shines. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to invite um, our prayers forward uh, at each corner of the room. Um, we just have people available that care about you and would love to stand with you if there is a, a prayer concern you have. Maybe just now in our time of prayer and reflection, there was something you were um, talking to God about and you're like, wow, maybe, maybe having someone join me in that would be an encouragement today. So I know that that takes some courage to do that, but um, man, I, I would say take advantage of the gift if you'd like someone to pray for you today. So um, how about you stand? And I bless you now to go out in the power of Jesus, knowing that he lives inside of you, and may his light and his peace be a blessing to those that you encounter today. Have a great holiday week, and we'll see you next Sunday.